Wow. Wow, that was a, uh, you know how to introduce Pastor Mindy. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you. And, and I really mean it. This isn't just, just to say it, but I am extremely grateful, um, thankful to be here. Um, so, yes, thank you. I'd like to honor you guys as well. Rich, Pastor Rich, and Pastor Mindy, you guys have awesome leaders. So thank you guys for having us, for trusting me. <clears throat> I wasn't going to bring up the point that we had never met, but you did already. So, I mean, that's trust right there, having never even met me, and I'm, you know, I'm here. I thought you guys were even going to be gone, and I was just like, mom and dad are gone. Let's party. <laughs> never met here, you know. <clears throat> we can do that exactly, exactly. Um, as she said, my, my name is Paris. Um, I'm originally from San Diego, California. You guys kind of already know our story a little bit, um, just in terms of traveling for the past year. We finally landed in the great state of Tennessee, so just south of you guys. Um, and we've been there for about the past six months, so the seasons are a little bit new to me. It's colder than usual. I have to wear a jacket. Had to hang up my sandals for a little bit, um, but we're doing all right. I wanted to start out, I, I had an idea for a message when, um, when I found out that I was being asked to preach, but as I was talking to the Lord about it, I was like, you know, first of all, is it okay that I talk about that, because that's kind of what I want to talk about, and I got the confirmation on that, but there was just something that I wanted to add really quick. Um, if everybody could just stand up really quick, if that's all right, I know, stand up, sit down, it's not quite as much as Catholic Church, so we're still doing okay. <clears throat> All right, um, being up here on stage, being able to speak in front of people is an honor. However, being, being part of this body, being part of the church, I want to make this extremely clear, is that you are an integral part, an important part of the body. Every single one of you, as I look at you guys, Every single thing. It's one thing to speak, and again, it's an honor. But I would almost argue that it's more important what you're sharing in a coffee shop with someone that you don't know. With seeing salvations, with sharing your story. Even if you only have one piece of scripture memorized, even if that's all you have, you still have a story to go with it. And there is value in that. That is huge. Each single one of you carries a gift a very special gift, and maybe even multiple gifts that is unique to you, that you are able to use. You have the Spirit of God inside of you. If you have accepted the Lord, then you have the Spirit of God inside of you. As man, I think we look up to celebrities and people and we think, man, it'd be really cool to meet them or just hang out for a day. And I know you've probably heard this before, but you literally have the creator of the universe at your disposal to be able to talk to whenever you would like, that his spirit resides within you. That power, the creator of the entire world, is something that you have that he has given to you as a gift. And so I just wanna, I want you guys to just do the whole like, turn to each other and say, you are an important part of this church. I want you to look at each other, okay? You are an important part of this church. You are a child of God. I don't know, I can't, I just felt something on that. I can't emphasize that enough. It's cool to speak, but it's even better to be bold and share with other people the gifts that you have. That doesn't have to be speaking. That can be your testimony. Um, <clears throat> you guys can all sit down. I won't, won't forget that I've done that before where people just standing up for a while and kind of like, oh, I guess we'll sit down. Sorry, I forgot. Didn't forget that time. Okay. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn to Joshua 1. We're just going to go through this real quick, and we won't come back to it until the end. Um, but I just want to start here. So Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. I think most of us are probably familiar with this verse, or at least we've heard this batch of scriptures. It's very, very important. 
After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Very popular. It's one of my kids' verses. Why? Because it's a fat promise. It's a good promise. I will be with you wherever you go. And how many are familiar that just because it's the Old Testament doesn't mean that it doesn't have current implications? that it doesn't have crossover. He said, oh, it was for that time. Oh, he was just speaking to Joshua. That doesn't necessarily mean that he'll be with me wherever I go. That's not true. Okay, there are New Testament, there are current covenant implications. He promises us his powerful presence. I will be with you wherever you go. His presence is with you. As we look at the leadership call on Moses and Joshua's life, I see that it all started in the presence of God. They were very radical, different leaders, but they were launched in a very similar way, okay? So this morning, where are we going? <clears throat> I want to talk about just nonchalantly, a really you know, small and consequential topic, and that is the presence of God. What is the presence of God? Anybody, anybody have any ideas? What the presence of God, how do you want to shout out any answers? You know, I mean, I'm used to doing young adults and, and, and youth group as well. And we're all about like how to pull you in and keep you engaged. <laughs> right? You should try telling Bible stories to kids at night. That's like a whole theatrical thing. What does it mean? What does it feel like? What is it? The presence is such an intangible thing, right? The presence of God, what is that? The spirit of God. Have you ever asked that question? My kids are always the best at questioning simple terms that we use, you know? And they're like, well, what does that mean? You know, and we're like, oh, did you see how the presence of God, how it fell on him? And they're like, Dad, what is the presence of God? Does God give us presents? And why did they fall on that man? Like, I didn't see it. Why are the presents falling? The concept is that if, if you do not understand or experience what you are getting, how can you appreciate it? Right? Right? So you know, a fun little example is that, especially in that my kids are getting older now, but <clears throat> the idea is if I were to give my, my son or daughter, my youngest, we'll say Revington, he's only, he's not two yet, a million dollars wrapped up in some pretty wrapping paper for Christmas, they would have no idea what to do with it, right? It has no meaning to them. It's green paper. That's it. You know, it would... They would probably rip half of it. They would probably color some of it, and the other probably would get stuffed in his diapers. And you're thinking, like, that's a million dollars. You know the value. They do not. So some of you might be looking at me, you're like, okay, yeah, Paris, we get it. Like, you know, there's, the, like, the internal eye roll that I'm not seeing because the lights are bright. Like, I know what the presence of God is. Obviously, they're not presents, and they don't literally fall on people, but... 
I know what the intimacy of God means. Well, let me just reinforce it then. Let me just bolster your understanding. I want you to go ahead and flip to Exodus 33 or turn on your phone. Exodus 33. We're going to be in the midst of the wilderness with the Israelites. We're going to go back in time. I'm going to flip there with you. Okay, this is verse one, so we'll make it nice and easy. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give to you your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, whatever other sites there are, and go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. That's how I like to say it, stiff-necked, stiff-necked, whatever. So let's take a step back here. What is going on? God does not seem happy. Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai, just a mountain in the region, to hang out with God and he'd been gone for quite some time. And so we have a good amount of chapters that encompasses all that God said to him, a lot to remember. But what happens? So he's gone, their leader, their fearless leader. And the Israelites are like, where'd Moses go? This guy sure has taken a long time. Hey, Aaron, can you make us one of those God thingies to lead us now? Because Moses is gone. We haven't heard from God. He's kind of like our, you know, mediator here. Nothing's happening. And could you, could you just make us one of those God things to lead us for the rest of the way? Because I don't know where Moses is. And so what happens? What happens? Does anybody remember? Come on, this is like the best kid's story. Yes. Okay, so God is angry, tells Moses, you need to get down there. All these people are going nuts. Moses is like, please, God, don't wipe them off the face of the earth yet. Let me get down there. Isn't it funny how God actually has these conversations, he's willing to like reason and bargain. It's kind of like when Abraham, he was going in and he says, please spare the city. Don't do Sodom and Gomorrah, right? If there's just 50 righteous, if there's just 40, if there's just 20, you know, 10. And God's like, okay, okay. And then, you know, well, we know how that story ended. But nonetheless, he's willing to bargain, right? He's willing to have conversation with him. He's like, please, I don't know what they're doing yet. It sounds terrible, but just give me, give me a minute to get down there. So he gets down there. This is, this is one of my favorite verses, kind of sad, but favorite. When Moses came close enough to the camp to see the bull calf and to see the people dancing, he became furious. There at the foot of the mountain, he threw down the tablets he was carrying and broke them. He took the bull calf, which he had made, melted it, ground it into fine powder, and mixed it with water, and then made the people of Israel drink it. That's fun. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that they, have, that they made you commit such a terrible sin? And Aaron said, Master, don't be angry. You know this people and how set on evil they are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. Then Moses, he, the man who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So I said, okay, bring me your gold and silver. And they took off their jewelry and gave it to me. I threw it in the fire and just out came this calf. He didn't chisel it or anything. It just magically popped out of there. So Moses has to do some damage control. It's funny how God is like, I'm going to wipe, wipe all these people off the planet. Well, Moses came down, actually saw what they were doing, and he kind of did it for them. Took out 3,000 people. So this is what happens. Is Moses basically said, God spare. God spares. Moses gets angry, and then when he goes back to the tent of meeting, because that's where he used to talk to God, right? God says this to him. He says, Moses said, he says, God says, I'm not going to go with you. He says, Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me, with your people, unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the people on the face of the earth? This is crazy to me. This is, this is a huge, huge direction change. Let me explain. 
God says, lead these peeps. I'm going to hold my end of the bargain, right? The only difference is I'm just not going to go with you. I'm going to send an angel in my place. You're going to still get your promised land, but don't worry, because if I stick with you, I'm going to kill y'all, is basically what he says. So it's kind of a bummer, right? It's like, okay, God's not coming with us, but he's still fulfilling his end of the bargain. Like, this is a good thing, right? We're finally going to get to this promised land, right? Right? This is what we've been waiting for. This is the moment. But let me give you some context just a little bit. We're going to back up. Let's imagine that you've been on this lifelong journey. Lifelong, okay? Let's say that you've had a dream. And everything in your life has a revolved around this dream, this destination, right? You've dreamt about it. You've breathed it your entire life. You've slept so many nights. And this is all that you've wanted, this dream. Everything has been devoted to this one goal. For Moses, the captivity of the Israelites was prophesied in Abram in a dream, okay? And God told him, your descendants will be in captivity for 400 years. He told Abram that way before the Israelites got to Egypt, right? So the Israelites were in captivity for 400 years under Egyptian rule. Then you have the life of Moses. So we all know the story, right? Is that Israel was starting to rise up. They were becoming more populated under Egyptian rule. The Egyptians were like, this is a problem. We need to eliminate some of them. So they killed all the baby boys, right? And so Moses was spared. His mom took him in a basket, sent him down the river. Down he goes. Pharaoh's daughter picks him up, right? She raises him up in the courts. And he becomes Egyptian royalty, more or less, right? accidentally kills an Egyptian, defending one of his own people, flees because he's about to die, and goes to Midian. He's there for a long time. People tend to skip that part. Gets married, he's a shepherd, all this stuff. And then God calls him out of there, right? In a burning bush, yes? Go up, take off your sandals. I am Yahweh, I am that I am, right? He says, I want you to go back to Egypt. Oh, no, I can't speak. Oh, well, this, this snake is going to turn in from a rod. Oh, I need Aaron to talk to me, right? And then he goes back to Egypt. And we all know this story, correct? Yeah? We got tons of plagues. We got serpents, frogs, blood, boils, hail, death. Let my people go. No, yes, no, yes. Finally, okay. Go to the Red Sea. Oh, no, we're trapped. I wish we would have just stayed in Egypt. And then, boom. Red Sea sparts, and they go, and then they end up in the wilderness, okay? But for Moses, think about his life, that trajectory. Spared in a moment he should not have been. All of this time, all, I need you to lead my people out of 400 years of the captivity. And then what was supposed to be like an 11-day journey, according to Google, turned into 40 years, so you got 40 years, right, that they're, they're wandering around in the wilderness. They should have just had boom, straight shot to this promised land that they have been waiting for, that God has been talking about for forever. So you have this whole setup, this whole life goal, at least for Moses, that I've been designed to take this people. Look at all these people back here that you're in charge of, that you're supposed to fulfill this promise that God has been telling them for about a long, long time. And finally, you get to this moment right here. And he says, okay, I can't take you guys anymore. I'm going to send an angel in my place, and you're still going to get it. I'm going to hold up my end of the bargain. You guys still get this promised land that you've been waiting for. And what does Moses tell him? In essence, he says, no. Everything you've been dreaming about, 400 plus years, a bunch of people relying on him. He says, if you're not going to go with me, I'm not going to go. That's huge. So much waiting. A whole life's mission 
dismissed. It's wild to me. But you know why? Because that's how much God's presence meant to Moses. That's how much God's glory meant to Moses. Moses had already experienced pieces of God's glory in time. And he knew what it meant. He experienced them in the bush. He had experienced them in a cloud, right? A cloud by day, fire by night, as he led them through the wilderness. He had experienced them in the tent of meeting, where it said he talked to him face to face as a friend. That's how much the presence mattered to Moses. He knew that the promised land, it was nothing compared to the glory, the manifested presence of God. Here's the, another fun part that I like. And the Lord said to Moses, because after he you know, gets done debating and talking with God and saying, well, if you don't go with us, I don't want to go. How will they know us apart from anybody else if you don't come with us? And the Lord finally concedes. He says, the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by your name. Moses doesn't celebrate. He's like, yes, thank you, God, please. Okay, like, all right, everybody, we're still going. God's still coming with us. Don't worry. He was in that tent meeting. He says, now show me your glory. That was his next statement. It was like this. I mean, can you imagine? Like, okay, God, God's still coming with us. He didn't, even, he didn't even pause. It was just like, now show me your glory. It's like, I need, I need your glory. I need to see your presence. And that's the part where God's like, well, I can't show you my face, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk past you. I'm going to put you in the cleft of this rock right here. Okay, I'm going to hide you, and I'm going to let you see my back. And that'll be what you get. And it ended up that the story goes on. Moses went back up for a while. And it said, it's like Moses went into greater and greater and deeper levels, right, of intimacy with God. So much so that when he experienced him, his whole entire appearance changed. It said he came back down later from the mountain and the people were like, you're glowing. Like, I'm scared of you. And so it said that when he would go in and see God, he would remove a veil but when he was around all the people, he had to keep a veil on because he would literally glow. In the intense presence of God, nothing else matters. Okay? It's the ultimate fulfillment of why you're alive. It satisfies the hunger that nothing has ever satisfied before and nothing comes close. And the reason is that we were designed to live in the glory of God. So let's transition just a little bit, okay? So we look at the Old Testament, and it said you have Moses as their leader, and you have everybody else, right? And it says when Moses used to go to the tent of the meeting, the cloud would come over. Everybody would step out of their tent, but from afar, and they would worship from their individual tents, right? But Moses had to communicate everything for them. It was when the Lord was giving the Ten Commandments verbally, right, that he came around the mountain in a cloud and thunder and everybody backed up. And they were so scared and Moses was the only one that actually stepped up to it and they said, we'll listen to you, but please don't let God talk to us. We're scared that he's going to kill us. You do it. You go up and you communicate. And so we fast forward, right? And so we have the Spirit of God, the presence of God in the Old Testament manifesting in different ways. But then you fast forward to the New Testament. You have the appearance of Christ, right? And what does Christ say about his presence? He said, it's better that I go, right? Because when I go, the advocate, the Holy Spirit will come, the helper, he will come. It is better that I go because Jesus was one man in the flesh, right? He was able to communicate it to 5,000 or however many people. But when he went, the advocate was able to come, right? And you have Paul who says the Holy Spirit inhabits you. That tabernacle, that tent of meeting that Moses used to go into as a physical place, guess what? You are walking temples. 
you are walking tabernacles. The Spirit of the Lord dwells within you. That is the replacement, yes. You get that access. You don't have to be the one standing out outside of your own tent watching the cloud. You have that pillar of fire by night, and what did that translate in Acts 2? It came in as a rushing wind, yes? And that fire sat upon their heads. The Holy Spirit came after Christ left. If you want to go after dreams and desires, okay, you start in his presence. If you want to write, speak, change the world, okay, you start in his presence. Getting the point? You want to parent well? If I want to parent well, I got to start in his presence. If you want to go after all that God has put in you, you start in his presence. If you want to overcome addiction, you start there. Okay, you want to overcome fear, you start there. And guess what? You get to end there too. But guess what? Beware that this place, okay, much like Moses exemplified, is that his presence, the deeper you go in intimacy with God, sometimes that original place, that original thought, that original desire that you thought was the end goal, that you thought was the reward, that you thought was the ultimate, seems less in comparison. Only because your main focus has been replaced with God himself. <clears throat> That's pretty much all I got. Um, I understand that this is just touching on the importance of his presence, not necessarily what it is. And I understand that sometimes that still feels very aloof, okay? But the Holy Spirit sometimes still feels aloof. I can't see him sometimes, right? That's something that, that, that you still have access to. That you can simply ask, okay? But I need to remind you that no longer is it not accessible to you Again, no longer are you standing outside of the tent of meeting because you didn't prepare yourself and clean yourself well enough. And so you got struck dead. Okay? God has made you, Jesus has made you clean. Holy and righteous. You have access to his spirit, the spirit that lives within you. You need to start there for everything. We all need to start there for everything. Okay. I'm going to pray really quick. Lord Jesus, I just thank you, God, for your presence. I thank you for what it means. I thank you for each and every single person here. Lord, that you have given us access, Lord, to your spirit, to your helper. I pray, Lord Jesus, for continued transformation, Lord God. Thank you for your love and your grace and the patience that you have with us that you sent your son, Lord Jesus. Thank you for all that you are and all that you do. You are holy, Lord God. You are worthy, Lord God. Everything that we are is thanks to you. Everything that we do is thanks to you. In Jesus' name.